and welcome to the video presentation for FormFit. In this video, we will discuss the inspiration and how it fits in with current dressmaking and tailoring tools. The entire design process from function to materials will be shown and finally future plans for this project will be laid out. Traditionally, one of two types of dress forms were used, either the one size fits all commercial version shown here on the left, or a higher quality professional model with a fixed size shown on the right. The form on the left offers more customization to a limit and can be cumbersome to switch quickly between sizes. The professional one size form is of much higher quality and is used for higher end draping and tailoring. However, it can only be used to make clothes of that one specific size, which would then have to be altered for the end user. FormFit is looking to bridge the gap between these two options. Shown here is the more common manually adjustable dress form. Here we can see that manually changing the measurements on this dress form is very slow and labor intensive. There are four dials for each measurement, in this case the waist, that need to be equally open to get a uniform circumference. After analyzing the existing products and the needs of seamstresses and tailors, six measurements were selected for form fit, which include bust, underbust, waist, high hip, hip, and stomach. The dress form will be constructed from 24 panels with internal gears and motors. Next, we're going to talk about the internal gear mechanism, which is responsible for moving the 24 body panels in the inwards and outwards direction. One assembly is used for one level of the panels, for example, moving all the waist panels out, and it is the same assembly for all other measurements. For the next bit of the presentation, we'll be discussing only one mechanism. First, we'll talk about how the design came about, then the prototype, which was able to be completed in the time frame available, then finish with discussing what we could have done throughout the semester. When we began this project, we brainstormed numerous ways for the panels to be moved in and out, and ultimately settled on a mechanism attached to the center rod, which moves the panels out radially. Initially, the simplest design, which we brainstormed, consisted of each panel being attached to a linear actuator attached to the center rod. This had a few drawbacks, though as linear actuators were quite expensive in the quantity that we needed, are quite heavy, and are finally not space efficient. So we began to brainstorm how we can take the same principles and apply them using less space and in a more cost efficient manner. We ultimately decided to use rack gears to facilitate the radial movement. We first thought to use one servo motor per rack gear, but decided that this poses the same problems as the linear actuators. The problem was then trying to create a gear train, which could use one motor to power more than one rack gear. After a strenuous process, we finally came to this design. This mechanism would be able to move one full section of the body, for example, the waist measurement. At the end of each rack would be one body panel, which would be able to move in and out. The racks are oriented at 30 degrees from the horizontal to mimic the elliptical shape of the female body cross section. To see how this works, let's start building the assembly from the bottom up. To begin, there's one spur gear which is mounted over a sleeve bearing. The sleeve bearing allows for low friction movement against the center dowel. There are then two bevel gears which are mounted to the outer casing. The gears start with a thicker diameter shaft, moving to a thinner diameter to ensure that they are perfectly aligned with the spur gear. The thin part of the shaft is essentially the thickness of the casing. The wider diameter shaft is filleted to ensure minimal friction against the casing. Next, the top sleeve bearing and the top spur gear are placed on top of the bevel gears. The outer casing, which houses all the components, is then added. In the side of the casing, you can see key-shaped holes. These were included to help assemble the bevel gears and allows for a design of bevel gear to include a mount to the servo motor. When prototyping, it was determined necessary to have a top lid to ensure the dowel stays center. The rack gears would then be inserted very carefully and calibrated so they are all the same lengths. As you can see, these rack gears mesh perfectly with the internal spur gears. The servo motor would then be mounted to one bevel gear and attached to the center rod using mechanical fasteners. This completes the design of the internal gear mechanism.
This same assembly would be repeated six times up the length of the dress form. Calculations were done to ensure that there was enough vertical space for all the assemblies to be included. The assembly was modified for the stomach and breast panels by changing the angle of racks with respect to the horizontal. To get to this final design, there was a lot of physical prototyping, including printing many of the components. I'll now show you how far we got with the physical prototyping. This is a 3D print of one of the interim designs. As you can see, the casing is a lot taller than the actual design, and there are no keyholes for the bevel gears. As it is an older design, there is some friction, which would have been alleviated with the new bevel gear design. This design also showcases the 3D printed racks, which are half the length of the ones that would have been water jet cut. Sabrina will later talk about how the panels are attached to the racks. All the components are assembled in the casing in the order shown. Moving on to material selection, we decided on a 3D printed gear train using the iGen printers, as they are free for students to use. Most of the prints were done using the resin 3D printer. The outer casing was printed using standard resin at moderate precision, but the spur and bevel gears were printed using a tough resin with ultra high precision, allowing for a perfect mesh between the gears. The one downside to the tough resin is that it can be brittle in thin parts, which can be seen here with the initial design for the bevel gear. Thus, in all our designs, the resin is thick enough that for our application, the brittleness of the material does not affect the performance. We tried printing the rack gear and the top of the casing using the resin. However, they need to be perfectly flat, and when the objects were removed from the resin print bed, they were bent, as you can see here. Thus, we experimented with printing in PLA and it worked quite well and suited our needs. However, the print bed of the 3D printer was only 14 and a half centimeters and the length of the racks needed to be double of that. We initially believed we could just glue the two short racks together to create one long one. However, this proved difficult as the connecting surface area was extremely small and the shear stress was too high to hold the weight of the panel. Thus, we went to the machine shop to get 30 centimeter racks water jet from acrylic sheets. This was set in motion, however, was canceled when the shop closed. Moving forward, we would have printed six of the final designs showcased earlier in this presentation. The racks would have also been water jet cut. After securing each panel to the end of a rack, we would have then secured the mechanism to the center rod using C clamps below each one to hold them at the right height. The racks would then be calibrated with the code that Sabrina is going to talk about next. Essentially, the months which were lost would have been primarily used for assembly and calibration of this mechanical uh, mechanism. For this design, the Arduino Uno was used, which has six PWM ports capable of each running a small motor. The motor used in the prototyping process is a small continuous servo motor. Capable of exerting nearly 7 newton meters, it had more than enough power to move the panels of the dress form in and out. Here we see the servo motor in action. It will first rotate in one direction, which would have moved the panels outwards a certain distance to achieve the inputted measurement. The motor will then stay at that position until the system is reset, when it will then rotate in the opposite direction for the same amount of time, thus returning it to the initial position. Here we see the user interface executing the same commands in the previous video. In this example, only one measurement is being tested. Once the motor has been on for the defined amount of time as calculated by the Arduino code, it will continuously wait until the reset button is pressed. Then, once pressed, it will return the motor and therefore the panels to their initial position. The servo motors used for the initial prototype were not ideal. Although very easy to code and set up, each motor has a unique start and stop value and are too imprecise to be reliable over time. It takes very careful calibration to ensure the clockwise and counterclockwise rotational speeds are the same, as well as making sure the motor does not creep forward over time when in the stop position. Future iterations would switch to a position-based motor as opposed to a time-based servo as we have here. Here we can see a very subtle movement of the motor in this sped up video. The motors are controlled by the interface panel, which is created through a cloud platform called MagunaLink. The interface panel is currently in its most basic state. 
Future plans for it included having a set of pre-made sizes corresponding to retail sizes 0 through 18 that the user could click on for general purposes. Another feature under investigation was the ability to input then store measurement data, eliminating the need to manually type in measurements for each client. Next, I'll discuss the construction of the dress form shell pieces, all the materials used, and how they would be connected to the gear assemblies. The shell pieces of the dress form were made from a layer of craft film for stability and a recycled thermoplastic called warbler. Altogether, 24 pieces were needed for form fit. To cover the warbler and create a soft surface for pinning and tailoring, three more layers were needed. Directly next to the shell would be a padded layer, which shown here is a sheet of fiber fill. On top of that would be a felt layer to give the dress form a nice, soft, uniform finish, which closely mimics the finish of existing products. The third layer is a fabric cover over the entire dress form that will be discussed in greater detail on the next slide. Here you can see all of the shell pieces that were created from foam and warbler, minus a few that had yet to be done. One issue that is not addressed in this design is the gaps between pieces as the dress form expands. Multiple options were discussed, however, nothing was found that could fully adapt to the expanding form. Further discussion and design iterations are needed to address this issue. The interim solution designed by the team was to create a fabric cover that could be slipped over the entire dress form. As it expanded, the fabric would stretch and provide a continuous surface for the user. To attach the shell pieces to the gear assembly, magnets were to be used. The reason for this was to have a non-permanent way of fastening the shell in the case that the angle or placement needed to be adjusted. A screw and nut would be used to fasten the magnet to the shell piece with a piece of metal secured to the end of the rack gears. The magnets are capable of supporting up to 15 pounds each, significantly more than any expected loads on the dress form. After eight months of work and some unprecedented setbacks, we are proud to show you the final form fit prototype. This form would be able to seamlessly change between six measurements based on user input from a user interface on a connected computer. This design would be a fantastic addition to a seamstress's toolkit. The design is robust, easily manufacturable, and is the ultimate cost-effective solution to bridge the gap between current hobby dress forms and professional grade dress forms. Thank you very much.